I've been here for a couple of days. I've been to a couple of talks. I then changed my talk after going to a couple of talks. That's iteration. It's good for you. Since I was here preparing to give my talk, I discovered that we don't have any headsets. And we can't show you the slide that's coming next. And as if by magic, I can now see the slide coming next, and I have a headset. I'm a creative director. <laughs> That's how that works. Before we go anywhere, uh, a big shout out and thanks to all the people who organize everything. You don't understand the amount of organization that goes into this. It's horrific. Especially to Yada, whoever he is, who fixed all the technology, which is now breaking. Um, so if we could have a quick round of applause for everyone who organized everything, because they never get any thanks. Apparently, I'm giving a talk, and then there'll be a Q and A. It's a one-hour slot, so I'm giving a one-hour talk. Well done. Keep up. Here we go. Are we ready? You're doing the bleeping, right? Here we go. So uh, this is my title slide. It upset the people who organised it because they gave me a template and told me to use that, and I use this slide. I've been using this slide for years. Every talk I ever give uses this slide. I just scrub things out and change it. Some smart aleck pointed out that it's got the year 2020 on it, and they said, there were no talks. I said, yes, that's why it's got a line through it. What are you talking about? But it teaches you a good creative director idea. Recycling is good. Thank you. Very <laughs> well. I'm here to talk about playing games. I love playing games. Playing games is how I got into gaming. Playing games is absolutely amazing. You get to do things that you can't do in real life. You get emotions and experiences stirred in your head. It's like a love affair deep into your heart. In fact, if you go forward one, it's like a love affair. Don't be surprised. I wrote the presentation. I knew that was coming. The reason that's important is because life can be rubbish and crap. And the way I see it, gaming is like a big mountain with a beacon on top of it that allows you to fly up and do things you can't do in real life, take you to places you can't normally go. Gaming allows you a release. It allows you to have excitement, fun. And love is a really interesting emotion because it can make you very happy. It can make you very elated. It can also make you very angry. Funny thing about love. People who play games, I find the best ones are in love with playing games. They can talk about it endlessly. They have t-shirts and posters, tattoos. They remember the most fabulous game experiences. And sooner or later, those people who play games want to go and make games. Now, here's the thing that you need to learn. And for the people who already make games, you've already learned this. Making games is nothing like playing games. Nothing. Once you are making games, it is very hard for you then to just think like you are playing games. It's very hard for you to talk to people who just play games, because they're not like you anymore. You've changed, like Daniel in the lion in the Bible. Profound. One thing you notice about uh, game playing is people don't usually remember anything about where they got the game, why they found out about it, when they downloaded it. They can't tell you how big the download is. They don't know how many patches they've done. Oh, go. But they can remember the emotion of the game, be it good or bad. They can remember that emotion decades later, decades later. So if you're going to make games, I think one of the best things for you to think about is how you're going to create those emotions, how you're going to stir in people that love affair. Because I think if you spend your time and energy there, you're spending it in the best place for game making. It's got a love to it. I tried to explain this a different way, and uh, that's on the next slide, which is going to come here. It's about magic. Now, I like magic. I don't mean real magic. I mean like cards and coins and, and booths and this. 
and I go to magic conventions and I, I buy magic tricks. I'm no good with them. The only thing I can do with my magic is I can make my money disappear. But other than that, nothing. But the thing about magic is for it to be successful, you have to be lied to and the lie has to work. Otherwise, it's not magic. And you can enjoy magic, you can watch it, you can be um, impressed, you can even try and guess how it works. But there's a difference between enjoying magic and doing magic and creating magic tricks. Because once you get to the next slide and we show you how it's done, the magic's lost. This is a different thing. And that's the difference between playing games and making games. And the reason I bring this up is because some people in this hall want to make games, or they think they do. And I want you to just pause for a second and realize you're basically looking behind a curtain and you can never go back. Once you've learned about budgets and tools and publishing and pipelines, payment methods, D1, D2, D7, attachment rates, once you've learned about stand-up, burn-down charts, once you've learned about the software didn't get updated, somebody deleted it from the cloud, once you've, worked, you've been working on a game for three years and then someone else brought out a better game, murderous. And so you need to realize that making commercial games, and I'm talking about commercial games here, quick caveat, I'm not talking about those little games that are works of joy that are talking about the society and the diary and the difficulty they have in their life. I'm not talking about walking simulators. I'm not talking about the games that aren't really games. They're actually emotional experiences usually pulled from the creator's soul. I'm talking about games that are commercial. Reasonably large teams, they spend money, they go out, they need to be good, they need to be emotionally engaging. And if you make those games, and people enjoy them, they'll give you money. It's not a bad thing. We do this with everything. We do it with beef burgers. But commercial game making is important. And so it's my first lesson in 21st century game making. You've got to learn how to compromise correctly. So up comes the, the rule. There's a rule. Learn to compromise correctly. I was at a talk yesterday. In fact, the guy who gave the talks right down here. It was a lovely talk. It was about should you work for a small company or a big company? And that's a great example of the commercial compromise I'm talking about. If you work for a small company, you're going to get a bit of freedom. You're going to work very hard. You're not going to get paid very much. But you're going to get a bit of freedom. You want to work for a big company, you're going to get a lot of scope. You're going to get a lot of game muscle. You're going to meet more people. That's the sort of commercial compromise you have to do. So if you want to write something down about where am I going as a game maker in the future, realize Sensible compromise is part of how you get your job done. I'll give you another example of sensible compromise. I'm currently not very well, and uh, it took me three days of land travel to get here, and it's going to take me three days of land travel to get home. I'm actually only here to give this talk, and then I'm going back to the hotel, and I'm going to pass out. I'm doing that because the people at Wargaming, who I work for, asked me very nicely to come here, and so I made a compromise. Okay. If I can make the travel, I'll give the best talk I can possibly give. But you need to let me travel by land, rest, and travel back. So Wargaming made a compromise. So the compromise goes both ways. It's super important, super good. You need to not to do it. Next one. Money. Money's not a bad word. Money's not a bad thing. We're not communists. Well, not yet. Cap. Capitalism is a good thing, ish. We spend money to acquire money, to have our lives, to pay our rent, get our food, buy things that we like, look after our family. We spend money on things that we love. Making games is making things that people love. If you do that, and you do it with a good heart, they'll give you cash. Not all of them, but some of them. And that's a good thing, which is why, my next lesson, think about the money. This is the game's business. It's a really, really tough business. I think the game's business is the hardest business in the world. If you're an engineer or a coder, you can make a lot more money a lot easier not playing, not making games. 
If you want a stable job, anything but games. You, you want to do a load of work that, that doesn't get a score and a review, where the internet's not going to pour hate on you? Almost any other industry. You want something where you're not suddenly going to turn around and there's no money and the studio's been burnt to the ground and you've been scattered to the winds? Anything but gaming. So realize the gaming business is tough. It's not a free ride, it's not easy, it's hard. Which is why you have to love making games. Because no sane human being would do what we're doing. Doesn't make any sense. It's completely crazy. Vegetables. What's important, you know, stop that. What's important is vegetables help you get strong and they're really good for you. And they, they, they put that thing that young people have in their eyes. What is it? That hope. <laughs> Everyone who did that dark laugh has been working in gaming for at least two years. Well done. Vegetables are important, and that's, uh, I'm here to tell you about some of the vegetables that you're going to have to swallow so you figure out what you're doing. But to do that, I also have to talk about the sins, sins of design, creative direction in the 21st century. The first sin I'm going to talk about is one of the things that disappoints me with my teams is when they bring me a game idea that is more fun on paper than it'll ever be to my players. So, this sin I don't want you to do. Try not to make games that are more fun on paper or in your head than they are for the players. One of the simple ways you do that, commercial compromise. It links, it's like I've written it beforehand. It's like there's a plan. So what is my job? I guess I should explain it to you. Uh, I'm a sort of design muppet with dynamite that causes a lot of trouble. The sort of person who turns up and steals hats and sunglasses. Because these aren't mine, I stole them off people in the audience. But I'm also, people also think, next one, people also think that it's some form of format, system, process. You have to go to college, you have to learn how to do what I do. Next one. Some people think that we're crazy scientists in the top of towers. It's alive! Or, the most popular one, that we're um, agents of evil. That's mostly accountants, by the way, and executive producers. All of that's not true. I was once asked what my job was like, and I said, imagine every day I'm in a controlled plane crash while filling out my American taxes while also having to do an oil painting of my boss every day. <laughs> yeah, you clearly, clearly have made games. Um, and I thought to myself, well, that's very funny, Paul, but it's useless if you're trying to write something down. It's useless as a takeaway. So I decided to give you a takeaway. Here's a takeaway. Um, I think it's important that you stay up to date with tools and technology. I think if you want to make games in the modern era, you have to go do your homework. And not just the tools and technology of game making, but also game launching, supporting, back-end, billing, servers, web services. Fantastically, this is all available. Go on the internet, you can download them, you can play with them. Or, my favorite technique, go talk to people who use them and get them to explain them to you as though they were explaining it to a dog. I find that's the best way to go. So, there's the, there it is, the rule. Keep up to date on tools and tech. Don't just stay back. I learned about, what was it called, No, Node.js? Was it Node.js? Where's he sitting? And I went, I've never even heard of it. And then when he finally translated it back, it was some sort of JavaScript. So I jumped back 20 feet and got a crucifix out. <laughs> he was very good about that. Next piece of rule I think you should have is an open mind. Open minds are really hard. You have them when you're about eight years old. They're taken away from you when you're 10 years old because you go to school, where we tell you things are right or wrong and therefore open minds are bad. I'll give you an example of an open mind. Back in the 1970s, it's a frightening concept, isn't it? The 1970s, my mother was okay 
that I was in my bedroom with a black and white television with a Spectrum 48K playing, and I wasn't outside kicking a football. He was open-minded about it. Unlike my father, who thought I was an idiot and I should get a proper job. Fast forward to 2020, and now I get told things like, well, you made a great career choice. And you, go, well, you weren't open-minded about it at the time. You thought computer games were stupid. The reason you need to keep an open mind is because you've got to put ideas in your head. The more ideas you have, the better chance you have of having an idea of your own. You need to take ideas from outside computer games. Too many people who make games only take ideas from gaming. That's bad. Go watch a ballet. Obsess over car handles. Worry about ticketing systems in aeroplanes. Just be inspired by nature. Take ideas from other places. Why? Because every new idea you're ever going to have is just an old idea dismantled and put together in an interesting way. The more open-minded you are, the better. I'll give you a classic example of game-making open-mindedness. Someone at your studio is an idiot. They are talentless. All they do is waste your energy. And they come up to you and go, I've got a suggestion for the game. You go, sit down, tell me about it. That's open-mindedness right there. Why? Because if you're a creative director like I am, it's not my job to come up with ideas. It's my job to recognize them, and then it's my job to filter them. It also means that sometimes I have a good idea that I can't use, because it wouldn't work. So I write it down and hide it for later in a folder called good ideas I haven't used yet. I also write down bad ideas, so I remember why they're bad ideas, because often I forget. That leads to, oh, you're ahead of me. Leads to another design sin. What are you? Another design sin. Um, designers often get told to do things that are different or distinct, and they have a problem. They, they go for subtlety. I'll give you a pragmatic and sensible example. I was making an RPG, Warhammer. It was very good. And a guy said, I've got a firebolt, I've got a wizard with a firebolt. I said, Can you bring me something different? He said, Yes, fireball. I said, OK. Can you bring me another thing different? He said, Yeah, fire flash. Any, anything else? Firewall. And then one of my other designers said, lightning. And I went, isn't lightning really just fire that's very quick? I want something different. And they're like, well, we haven't got an idea. I said, OK, how about the wizard casts a spell and rabbits are summoned? And they were like, rabbits? I went, yeah, different. Look at the bones. Thank you. <laughs> so I had a CAT scan, because it wasn't well. And it lived, it lived. No, I had a CAT scan, because uh, I was trying to figure out what my brain was like, because it doesn't work the way normal people's works. And that's because I'm dyslexic, I'm colorblind, red, brown, and green. I'm deaf at the top third of hearing. Asthmatic, rubbish, rubbish. It meant that I was an utter failure at school. So I came and left school at 15 with nothing. And everyone said I wouldn't amount to anything. And the only thing I had in my head that worked is I loved games. So I just decided to make games forever. And that's really important because what it does is it shows you the industry is still capable of responding to people with passion and love and desire. So I'm going to show you a picture of my office. It's covered in lots of images of all the games and hardware that I've ever played. This actually isn't my current office, one of my older offices. It's um, absolutely terrifying when you see it, because it's all over the place. But what it shows you is that open-mindedness hopper in my head of things that I'm doing. It's also why I'm so obsessed with games and so obsessed with playing and making them. It's why I get so happy when I meet people who also want to do that. Now, one of the problems with this is you can forget about playing games when you're making games. So I've got another tip for you. It's really important that you keep up to date with all the things that are going on in the industry. And it's exhausting, by the way. That's actually on the next thing. There you go. 
the payment systems, the play styles, the platforms, the pixels, other things beginning with P. It's important because your job is to stay up to date with the gaming world. And if you're not careful, once you start making games, you get comfortable, you stop paying attention to what's coming next. And one of the easiest ways to sort that out is when you come across something you don't understand, ask somebody about it, learn it. Or, what I do, I watch my children. They play all sorts of rubbish. And I try to, <laughs> try to understand what it is. And the reason that that's important is because I was on the talk, the one about the small companies and the big companies, twice look, and uh, there was uh, an abbreviation used, ROAS, R-O-A-S. And he was up there on a slide and he said, oh, great news, the ROAS for the UK is 110%. This is amazing. And so I stuck my hand up in the middle of his talk, because I'm rude. And uh, he was very gracious, he stopped. He said, I said, excuse me, if you don't mind asking, what does ROAS mean? And he said, oh, it's return on advertising spend. So last night I went and looked it up and I read about it because I'd not heard of it. And so if I'm capable of finding new things and adding them into my brain, I'm pretty sure you lot are. You don't even need a cowboy hat. <laughs> Gaming has gone mainstream. Now it didn't used to be mainstream. It used to be a niche thing. Try and think about those bands you liked before they became really popular. And once they became really popular, you hated everyone who liked that band and everyone who liked that album because they weren't the true believers. They weren't following it when nobody followed the band. Well, that's what get, happened to gaming. Round about PlayStation 2, and it's just gone on with rocket fuel since then. The problem with things that are mainstream is that, next one, everyone's an expert now. You wouldn't believe the amount of people who know how to do my job. The answer is everybody. They'll come up to me and they'll go, I like that game you're working on, but you know one thing you could have done? No, I don't, go on, tell me. The closest thing I can put it down to is my friend makes movies, and he's constantly getting this. Movie, <laughs> oh, I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a story for you, have you? I'll tell you who you should cast in that movie. You surprise me. Um, so, Everyone's now an expert. More dangerously as game makers, that means executive producers, accountants, CEOs, actually think they know what they're doing when it comes to making games. Terrifying, terrifying. <coughs> Which of course leads me to the Beatles. Keep up. Uh, the Beatles are important because until they turned up, pop music was basically a niche thing. Parents didn't pay attention to it. It happened in the background somewhere. They went to crazy shops to listen to records. And, and then the Beatles came along and utterly blew everything to pieces. They changed it completely forever. So much, in fact, that you can't go back. And from them, it continued evolving until it just became mainstream to the point now I no longer understand any music whatsoever. What the Beatles taught you was to be interesting in how you did your music. From a game design creative director point of view, I would say design dangerously. Probably the only way to design these days. That's because the Beatles were game changers or music changers. Game changers come up all the time. Minecraft, game changer. Smartphones, game changer. Internet, game changer. Rock band, game changer. There used to be a time when gaming was very simple. It's not anymore. It's multifaceted, depending on country and culture and people and input devices. We still have lean back gaming. That's when you're on a couch and you elbow your friend and you go, you're rubbish at this game. And we still have lean in gaming, which is usually high arousal, high attention. They're usually on PC. They're the people who lean in towards their computer screens with their mouse and their keyboards and they and can't see anything else. We still have curl up gaming, where you're on your black glass with a blanket, playing Farmville, sending me cows. But now we also have online gaming, we have in front of the screen gaming, rock band, we also have party gaming, 
We also have uh, very <laughs> highly strategic gaming. We've got gaming all over the place. So it changes forever, game changing. Moving on, from music, there was uh, magazines. Cream magazine, you've never read it, don't worry. Um, it's where people used to learn about music. It's where they used to read about it. It's where they used to get engaged, interviews and all that. They had editors. The stories were put together correctly. They had journalistic integrity. We've outsourced that in the modern era. We call it Reddit. It's a lot of anonymous people who've never made a game in their lives. Who all use the same font, so you can't tell which one's useful and which one's stupid. We've outsourced that concept, it's gone. That's what game changing's about. There's a guy called Lester Bangs. Lester Bangs doesn't matter, he's dead. He used to write about music and he wrote about it in a really important way. It felt really monumental. Well, we don't do it anymore, we outsourced it. Streamers and influencers and YouTubers. We actually have our own publishing and marketing people terrified of these people. Terrified. Fascinating. So we've outsourced how we get the information, we've outsourced how we comp compile it, we've outsourced how we get it reviewed, we've outsourced how we market test it. And that led me to an idea that I think you need in the 21st century. Outsourcing is only going to become more important. Outsourcing is going to become more important. It's like I wrote it. Be it outsourcing artwork or level building, UI, back-end, payments, billing, you might be an outsourcer. You might be someone who manages outsourcing. Well, the way we can move information so far, the amount we can move and the speed we can move it, outsourcing is going to become more and more important to the making of games. So don't be afraid of it. And if anything, the COVID thing speeded it up. We now have studios that effectively are outsourced because they don't go back to their studios. They'll work from home in their pants. With that in mind, I thought I'd share with you that's my version of the Cream magazine, Zap64. I played on the Commodore 64. This is the magazine that I used to read once a month. Think about that. Once a month, I got information. My kids get it every 30 seconds. And I didn't have Lester Bangs. I had these guys. A guy called Gary Penn. He was my Lester Bang. Why am I bothering to tell you that? I'm telling you it because I am formed from the time and place that I grew up in and what I had access to. It's deep in my gaming DNA. And all of you have your own gaming DNA. From where you were brought up, what access to hardware you had, what games you could play. And it's so deep into your marrow, you might not be even aware that it's there. More importantly, everyone that you meet has their own version. Which leads to, remember, you're defined by your location your access to technology and platforms, the people that you meet. OK, we're going to get to another game design sin. This one's very important. I'm just going to put it up. Excitement is why we want to play games. Emotion is why we want to play games. I often meet my designers, and they want to balance everything. They want to make everything fair and equal. You don't want to do that at all. That's a terrible idea. I suppose you could balance an economy. I might give a good grounds on that. If you don't believe me, then play any boss fight. Not balanced, for excitement, or at least the good ones are. So if you're going to make gaming, remember, don't do that. Which leads me to Ocean Software. Ocean Software made most of the games that I played when I was a kid. But the reason they're there is because sometimes you're going to have to cross the ocean. When I talked about compromise and love affair, what I'm actually talking about is how much do you care about being successful in making games. I've moved house 23 times. I've lived in four continents. I've lived and worked in 11 countries. Why? Because we're digital gypsies. You go where the work is. And if you don't think this is special to gaming, I've got a friend of mine who's an actor. Well. He's actually a waiter, waiting to get a role to be an actor. But he does the, you know, an unemployed actor, like most actors. The thing is, if he was offered Hamlet, and it was in a city miles away, he'd go. He'd just go. 
And if you're in a band and they offer you a tour of Asia, you go. The people who care about what we do, the people who understand the artistry of what we do, the people who want to change gaming and make things for people are willing to move. The more you're willing to move, the better your chance of excelling in the industry. We can't all be lucky enough to be born and raised in a city that's got lots of studios. You want to increase your chance? Go where the work is. Be prepared to do it. That's the compromise thing. Where's that got me to? Ooh, ooh, done that one, I've done that one, done that one. That's one of the reasons I love wargaming, by the way. We have studios all over the place. My last, oh, hang on, one, two, three, four, five. The last five countries I've lived in have all been moving to wargaming studios. Always nice to work for a company that's got lots of studios, <laughs> except some of them. Uh, quick walk down memory lane, that's Ron Hubbard. You don't know who he is, it doesn't matter. He made a load of bleeping noises on the Commodore 64. Because um, I'm deaf at the top 30 hearing, I can't really enjoy music. But I'm told that all humans who can hear have a soundtrack to their life. And they can hear a piece of music from their past, and it works like a time machine. They can remember where they were, what they were doing, what room they were in. They can remember the emotional experience. It's a magical effect. And I think that that's great. But I've got a game track to my life. You show me a certain icon or a loading screen or a, a level or some loading music or a poster, and I can go right back in time and tell you where I was when I played that game. The equivalent of my game track to my life. Oh, did you get into another sin? That one happens all the time. The players don't like the game, they're playing it wrong. What? No, no, they don't like the game. Well, they're playing it wrong. The purity of the design is everything. What are you talking about? My game's come ruined. You've got to let your players have fun. I'll give you a practical example. Actually, it's two examples. Sid Meier made a game called Civilization. At the time, it was just called Civilization. It ultimately became Civ 1, because he made a sequel. And he discovered two things. The first thing he discovered is that uh, the player is in a map, and there's lots of other enemies. And initially, the enemies had their own empires, and were building them up. And he figured that, that was the purity. But he found out it was much more fun to just randomly drop the enemies as the player was unlocking the map. So he gave up on the purity of the map and just dropped enemies where he wanted. The second thing he discovered is that when the armies were fighting, if he told them it was a... You know, pray to for. Uh, <coughs> if he told them it was a 50-50 chance of winning, a coin toss, players were convinced the computer was cheating. Never 50-50. And so he had to change it so that it only said 50-50 when you had a 75% chance of winning. And then people said, oh yeah, now it's balanced. <laughs> it loops, it links, it all links back to itself. That leads to Pareto. There he is. Pareto's got an, uh, a system called the Pareto system. Next one. You've never heard about it. It's an 80-20 system. It's one of those mystical number systems. I'll give you a, a simple example. You have a shop. 20% of your customers will end up generating 80% of your revenue. Or you have a shop, and 80% of the things you sell only make 20% of your money. Pareto's system is based on a map of a city that he did where he discovered that 80% of the city was owned by 20% of the people. It's not actually his system. Next one. system was made by this guy, a guy called Durant. He just named it after Pareto. Always good to have a system named after you. But I want to talk about Pareto's actual system. He's the guy who's responsible for there are two types of people in the world. Pareto said there are creatives, people like me, we have ideas, which I do, but we have no money. That's true. And then there is another group of people, imagine there's one here, and they are very, very rich, and they invest, and they have no ideas. And the only way they can be successful is if the rich people go to the creative people and invest in the creative people so that the creative people can be creative. Two types of people. He said there are two problems with this. Problem number one, that the creative person gets confused and cannot be at peace realizing 
that the rich person's just going to get richer and richer and richer, and the creative person's really just going to get creative. They're not really going to get paid. He said, your creative person has to be OK with that, right? which is a bit sad, but turns out to be true. He said, the second problem you've got is if the person with all the money suddenly thinks they're creative. Disaster. That gets back to that mainstream, everyone's an expert thing. Now, I gave this talk at Valve, not this exact talk, but it had the Pareto bit in it. And quite, quite rightly, I can't hear you. The, the deaf at the top third are hearing bit. No creative people get rich. <laughs> what are you talking about? I've never met one. Picasso, I guess. Anyway, the guy asked me a question. He basically said, don't you think your Pareto two types of people thing is rubbish? Don't you think it's a simplistic system? Don't you think it doesn't answer your question? What if there's a creative person who gets rich? He said, I fundamentally reject the idea of these two types of people. I think it's a sham. You've come all the way to Valve. We've come here. We've sat down. We've listened to you. It's preposterous that you should say that. Ill thought out, ill conceived. And I said to him, well, that's interesting, because I think there are two types of people. The people who believe there are two types of people I never tire of telling that story. <laughs> I enjoy going to Valve, by the way. I suggest you should all do it. It's quite a hoot. <clears throat> Quick tip. Creative management, you're working through other people. Not true if you're in a small company. In a small company, you're working 72 hours a day, working in dog years. But in large companies, the only way you can get things done is working through people. The only way you can work through people is doing really good communication. If you don't do really good communication, we're not going to get anywhere. What I do, and I stole this from an American coach, I chase perfection so I can get to excellence. Just can't get to perfection, but I chase it. And you have to do that by infusing other people. And the most important thing you've got to get from other people is they need to know what you want them to do, and then they need to own what you want them to do, and they need to believe it's a good idea, and then ultimately they need to, it needs to be their idea. So it's communication, and it's exhausting. I spend all my time communicating. And I'm an introvert. You have no idea. Once this talk's over, I'm going to my hotel room, and I'm just going to hate the human race for three hours. <laughs> very, very, very upsetting. Which leads to talking heads. Because things stop making sense. And as the days go by, you know, this is not your beautiful house. You're not making your beautiful game. This is not your beautiful idea. And you think, my God, how did I get here? What have I done? And I think that to prevent that happening, a good piece of advice in the 21st century for making games is find out what you're good at and stay there. I'm not kidding. All this twaddle about work on your weaknesses. No, no, neutralize your weaknesses. Sharpen your strengths. Be good at something and then excel at it and be happy at it and know what you're rubbish at. I can't go to meetings. I don't understand the law. Don't give me a budget. I'll be useless at it. I mean, we can go broke in creative ways if you want. <laughs> but it's really not a good use of my time. I'm no good at leases, rental agreements, licensing. I want a whiteboard and a pen. I want to make games. So that's what you need to do. And that leads to the big sin of making things too hard to explain. Come up. For everybody in the games industry, the, after the love affair of making games, the next thing I think is super important is learning how to communicate. Both ways, broadcasting, receiving. After that, there's cognitive requirements, and somewhere down the line, you actually get to skill. But definitely, this bit 
is where you, you learn what you're doing. Because if it's too hard to explain, no one's going to figure out what you're doing. Next one. So this is a ring pull on a can of soda. This is what I grew up in. You, you could then break them off and fire them as spinners. If you put four on your hands, you could be Wolverine. And American movies, like E.T. and the rest of it, they used to have these cans, but they used to do something. They used to take the cans out of the fridge and go, dug, dug, and then drink them, and there was no ring pull. And I always used to think, what the hell is that? What's going on? It was 15 years before I finally discovered this, and I went, oh, that's what that is. It's a different way of, it doesn't have a ring pull. And that was interesting because it reminded me that things are new and exciting or funny or interesting when you encounter them. It doesn't matter how long they've existed. When you encounter it, that's when it starts its history with you. That's why a joke can be told 20,000 times, but until you hear it, it doesn't exist. And that's important when you're making games because you've got this habit of throwing things away. When I go, no, it works, it's wonderful. They've never seen it before. There's loads of stuff from the 1900s in gaming that we don't do anymore. But we could do, because it was pretty cool, and the kids haven't seen it. So don't be afraid of old ideas. They remain new. What's old becomes new again, which leads to cassette tapes. There you go, look, they are new when you experience it. That's the rule. Cassette tape. This is how I used to get hold of computer games. They were on tape. They made crazy noises. Uh, I had uh, an iCloud account back in the 1900s. It was called my school bag. And in my school bag, I had a world-class pirating system, BitTorrent. It was called a twin cassette deck. And for, with that, I could record one game onto another tape, put it in my bag, take it to school, and trade it. I was a copyright thief. What I actually was was a poor kid who could afford to buy one game a month, and that game I had to trade with everyone else. Quick tip, if you're going to get into computer games, stop stealing people's copyright. It's bang out of order. You get money because people look after your copyright. You're getting paid. Stop bit torrenting. Pay your goddamn way. It's a creative industry. Show some backbone. Of course, <laughs> of course, <laughs> If you're not in the game industry and, you're, and life's hard and it's uh, pirate away, <laughs> I, I, I mean, the cost of living is ridiculous. <laughs> but you as, a, you, as an individual in the area, you should do your bit. Uh, what this taught me is that good game design, good game making, comes not from having an unlimited budget, but when you're robbed of resources, which is the rule. When you're robbed of resources. Making games is not always great. Sometimes it's fantastic. Apparently it can be bad at times, but I don't remember them. But one thing I will tell you about commercial games is they're not art. I think little games can be art. I think games that aren't supposed to make money can be art. I think Passage, the computer game Passage, I think that's art. But I don't think that big games are art. I think big games that are commercial and successful can be artful, and I think you can admire them after the fact as having some of art within them, but I think it's very dangerous for commercial games to start on a footing of, I'm going to make something because it's art. I think that way lies madness, or to put it better, <laughs> thank you, thank you, the educated classes are here, well done, you may stay. Um, <coughs> And the reason for that is coming up with it, and we're going, to do a, we're going to do a couple in a go in a minute, ready? But I'll tell you what, so we're from. There's a picture from the golden age of painting, apparently. And that's Superman from the golden age of comics. And Woodstock, apparently, the golden age of music, according to my dad. That's uh, the Chrysler Building, golden age of architecture. That's Fangio, golden age of uh, Grand Prix. And that's, the, that's Jordan, Jordan's Bulls, golden age of uh, <coughs> basketball. So people name golden ages, which is, I think is kind of, kind of bonkers. And 
We all have our own personal golden age. That's nothing to do with what society tells us. It's what we decide on. Our own golden age, we divine. I'm going to take you through mine to make the point. So, uh, as a teenager, not this album. It just had the word teenager in it. And that's where my golden age starts. But to put it in context, it's basically when Empire Strikes Back was in the cinema. That's a big building with a screen that you go to. And then uh, Say Anything by John Cusack. Uh, he's holding up, if you can imagine, an enormous iPad with a big speaker. <laughs> and between there is all the games I care about and all the hardware I care about. Everything before, move on, kind of looks like that. And everything after is a disaster and useless rehash and is plundering my childhood. There are no good games other than the period I just showed you. There aren't any. End of subject. They're all the good games. Because that's my golden age and that's my game track. Now, that's only true for me. Each of you has your own golden age. Some of you are still living it. My mother is having her golden age in her golden years. Facebook cows. Marvelous. The reason that's important is because you can talk to anyone in gaming about their golden age. What's your favorite piece of hardware? What's the game that just makes you smile? What's the game that just makes you happy? What's a game you'd never play? And then you can start a conversation and years drop off you. It's like having a facelift or Botox, it's marvelous. There's a reason I keep talking about it. Learning your golden age is important because when you meet other people, you should talk about their golden age. So if you meet someone like me and you want a job, I suggest talking about games that are between Empire Strikes Back and Say Anything, because they're the games I give a damn about. Whereas when I'm talking to a new young designer, I talk about all the games that are out now, because that's their golden age. Golden age are important, it's how we trade information. But another design sin, stop being precious about your design. You're not the audience. They're right, you're wrong, within reason. They have good ideas, even if they're not yours. And sometimes you need feedback. Don't get too uptight about it. We're spending a lot of money and using a lot of people. We're asking people to bring their labor, which after their love is the most important thing they can possibly give you. Being too precious about your design just turns you into a git. And that's of no use to anyone in the creative space, which leads to the PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 marked the end of photorealistic game changing. It's hard to imagine now, but if you brought a game out prior to the PlayStation 2, if it didn't look more realistic, if it didn't try to look more like a movie, if it didn't look more like it was getting to perfection, then your game was rubbish. It was crap. It was like painting when they were painting and trying to make it so it was absolutely lifelike. And then the camera came along and it could do a better job than any painter, apart from a few. And so painting had to go in a different direction, cubism and, and surrealism. Well, that's what happened here. All of a sudden, you could use 8-bit graphics again. You hadn't been allowed to do that. And what that taught me is there's no such thing as retro, not anymore. The whole world's available to you. You can make any game you want. You can have squares and triangles and bleeps. Nobody cares anymore. No one's going to judge you for it because it's gone mainstream. Which leads to a wooden door. So if you open the doors to perception, it's very important. I'm a creative director, I'll show you one. Next one. <laughs> this is on the side of a cafe in England. Those lines are straight, absolutely straight. They're not angled at all. That's your eyes playing tricks on you. That's important because that happens in game making all the time. Here's another quick question for you. Is square A darker or lighter than square B? Seems like a straightforward question. If you move forward, you find out they're exactly the same color. Go back, go forward, go back, go forward. Mind boggling, isn't it? Like being a cat at a laser. That's because things often can't be true, but are true. Moving on. Colorblind, I'm colorblind. I've been reliably informed there are numbers in here. I don't believe you, but whatever. All right, it's a group delusion. I believe one of them is a two. 
can't really remember. Uh, uh, very ir irritating because everyone can see them and I can't, therefore I must be stupid. Because it's blindingly obvious, it's in front of you, how can you not see it? You're a moron. It doesn't matter the fact that I can't see it, and I tell them I can't see it. I'm at fault, apparently. Which is why I like this circle. Ha, 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 ha. Moving on. I love these arrows. They're absolutely amazing. My uh, boss said, um, you've got such a thing for them. I said, I, I said but the white arrows are so lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Move on. Holistic thinking, also called lateral thinking. Um, I'm a big fan of this. There's a great experiment where they give you a shovel, take you out into a garden, and there are nine plots of land. And they give you a timer, and they say there's a box buried here in one of the nine plots, and in the box is the reward. Off you go. Most people can't find it. Land's too big, time's too short, shovel's too small. But some people do find it. But hardly anyone takes the box out and keeps digging and finds the bigger box. Lateral thinking, holistic thinking, thinking broad. That's important because we are taught at school to be closed-minded and have things that are right and wrong. And what that leads us to is stopping when we think we've got the answer. My advice to you in the 21st century, when you've got the answer, write it on a whiteboard, then keep, keep going. See if there's a better answer somewhere. Next. Because it's complicated. Next. What to do or what to do. It gets so confusing. Um, what I would suggest is if you've got 10 seconds to give someone an answer, Use nine of them to think. A thought in it. And here we go. Stop designing things that are beyond your resources. I've got an accountant in. <laughs> Everyone does this. It's really hard. If you've got to cut scope, cut breadth, not depth. Write that down. That's gold. Next. There is no such thing as a fun matrix. There's no such thing as giggle hurts. Anyone who comes and tells you that there's some formula for gaming is full of crap. It's not done like that. It's a creative endeavor. You can't go in and just find the solution. You, you, you not, theory of fun, burn it. Next. Otherwise, you turn into sheep. General Patton in World War II had a great line. If everyone's thinking the same thing, someone isn't thinking. It's OK to have what I call creative friction. Too often, we try and make everyone get on together, hold hands, and sing Kumbaya. That doesn't get you to a great game. I'm not talking about being an ass. I'm not talking about arguing. I'm talking about creating creative friction. It's OK. It's OK not to agree and debate. It's what makes us better at what we're doing. Next. Urgent, trivial things will kill you. Stay away from them. If there's only one thing you take away, take that. We've got to do it now, but it's trivial. We're now, it's trivial. We'll die. Stay away. I've got three things, and we're in the big ending. Emotions versus mechanics. I was asked this question last night, so I wrote it down. You can put a new mechanic in your game design. It, it might get you somewhere, but if you plan for emotion in your design, it will always get you somewhere. If in doubt, play for emotion. And remember, life grinds at your soul. It grinds at your soul. It grinds at our players' souls. Gaming is how we remember we have a soul. It's a wonderful, harmless experience that makes us love each other. Now, I don't deserve my job, but then I don't deserve my asthma and my colorblindness either. You can get what you want if you focus, try hard, work hard. Think about this, integrity, passion, drive, willingness to work hard, willingness to commit, you don't need to go to college for them. It's nothing to do with breeding. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't care what country you came from. Better yet, they're all available for free, for free. All you have to do is make the decision to do them and you're fine. And that leads to a piece that is absolutely true. This is the hardest job in the world. So why the heck am I doing it? Well, because I'm in love. Why else would I be doing it? Oh, I need that thing. That's me the thing. Here we go. Crescendo ending, we might as well. 
That's because the Beatles are fantastic. Star Wars is always going to come back. I love the Stone Roses. Lord of the Rings proves you can have a better movie than a book. The hope will return. I'll go what Trump says. Doom is eternal. Walls will get smashed down. Uh, new technology becomes old technology. Warcraft is great, but it's times past. We are going back to the moon. Metal Gear Solid is everywhere. I don't, even though I don't understand it. But that changed gaming forever. Street Fighter is great. I've never played it. Everyone should learn about Factory Records because it's how to fail GoldenEye is the greatest game ever made. If you don't believe me, you're an idiot. Mario is the only character we have in gaming in 50 years. Nirvana is now a t-shirt. Google are now making games. The Sex Pistols became important again. God save the king. That was once cool. You can repurpose memorabilia, other people's images and pass them off of your own and win in a court of law. Final Fantasy, it's not your fault if Final Fantasy XI was the first one you got. It's not your fault. <laughs> the end. Thank you very much. Don't you think I have that? Thank you. Where's, where's your glasses? Oh, that timing was perfect. No questions. Thank you very much. I can't answer questions. I'm really not very well. I need to get off stage. Thank you very much.